Hey everyone, I've just put a video together of a wisdom tooth extraction that I did. Uh, this is for a lady with a partially erupted wisdom tooth, which means it was just showing through. Uh, we go through the case selection as well as the risk assessment and then through the procedure itself. Enjoy! So this patient came in with pain from her lower left wisdom tooth. Uh, it first started about two years ago. She said that it would happen probably about once a year, would last for a few days and then it would go away. But this most recent bout has been a bit more severe and has lasted longer than what it normally would. When she first came in, uh, we took this x-ray or another dentist actually took this x-ray and said, look, because of how close this tooth is to the nerve that supplies sensation to basically the left side of your lower jaw, it's a little bit risky for us to do it. We should be sending you to an oral surgeon. Basically, you've got this nerve that runs along the bottom here, and if it looks like it's quite close, taking this tooth out can sometimes damage the nerve and you can lose sensation to your face for either forever or for a, a transient period of time. The patient was going to see the oral surgeon, but by the time that she came to make the appointment, the pain had gone away, so she forgot about it. She's now come in, in a lot of pain. When I saw this x-ray, I said, look, if I was gonna take this tooth out, I would probably wanna have a 3D x-ray of this tooth, just because I wanna make sure that I can actually see where the nerve is, where the tooth is and make sure they're not close to each other. She was a bit averse to doing that just because she is pregnant at the moment. She's four months pregnant and said, look, can we just maybe do something in the interim? I really want to have the tooth out, but I don't want to have an x-ray if I don't have to. I then had a look in the mouth and you can see here that quite a bit of this tooth is actually shown up, shown up through the gum. So there's about a quarter of the front portion of that tooth that is actually showing through. And if you compare that with the OPG, it's actually in a completely different position. This one, it's kind of angled on a maybe a 70 degree angle. This one, it's now pretty much upright and it's come up maybe two or three extra mils. So I said, look, actually, in me now reviewing this case, I think this is something that we can actually do. And the risk of damage to that nerve is actually really, really low. And based on the OPG, by the looks of these roots, it should be an okay extraction. She's like, all right, perfect, I'm really happy, let's do it. So let's go to the extraction. So once the patient is nice and numb, the first thing that I do is I'll do a distal relieving incision. So this is basically an incision that goes uh, along the gum behind the tooth. And how far I go in generally is the length of what the tooth is. I try to be as minimal as possible with how far I go back just because I, I think that it helps with healing. Uh, but as long as I can actually see enough of the tooth. In this case, because it's partially erupted, it's already kind of pointing in the right direction for me. I knew that I wouldn't have to raise a very big flap. So we head backwards, making sure that I'm more towards the cheek side than going towards the tongue side, because there is actually a nerve on that tongue side that supplies sensation to the tongue, and I obviously don't want to cut that. After I've made that distal incision, I then go and make a sulcular incision along the tooth in front of it. And this is basically just to cut the fibers that are attached to that tooth as well. So when I do actually push that gum out of the way, it doesn't stick to that tooth. So do you do it in a vertical pattern? Sometimes I flip it over, sometimes I flip it back the other way. It just depends on, on the teeth and the angle, whatever's easiest. Uh, and making sure I go over that a few times. So when it does actually come time to move that gum out of the way, it does uh, make your job easy. When I was first doing these, I often wouldn't do this stage enough and trying to raise that flap was quite difficult and I'd have to re-go back over it anyway. Uh, once I've done that as well, I, I kind of get a better view or a better idea of how far back I have to go. Uh, and then this is the actual raising of the flap. So you can see the gum comes away quite nicely there and it just gives me better access for when I actually do try and take this tooth out. I also get a better visual idea on how much I need to do uh, on going backwards along this tooth and see if I need to make an incision any further back. Um, so I push the, the gum out of the way and just see, okay, can I see much of the crown? Do I need to see a little bit more of that tooth? Sometimes, well, if you don't reflect that back enough and you don't actually make an incision that goes back far enough, when you try and take the tooth out, the gum is basically what's stopping it from coming out. The tooth might be loose, but if you haven't made a hole big enough, then it physically can't come out of that hole. So you do have to make sure that you have gone far enough back. I then put the, eleva the periosteal elevator on the left side of the tooth, just to basically retract that. So by this stage, I've actually got the assistant with the mirror, and she's on the cheek side. So when she pulls that across, it gives me better access, but it also pulls that tissue across as well, so I can see more of the tooth and get a better idea on when I do try and take it out, will it be able to fit through the hole that I'm now making? Uh, I decided I wanted to go back a little bit further, just to make sure that I, I do have enough of a view there. Hey, just a thought while you're watching. If you're getting something out of the video, hit the like button or hit the subscribe button. It really helps me out a lot. So the first thing I do is go to it with a Luxator. I try on the buckle first to see, or the outside of the tooth, to see if I can get any movement. 
uh, but if not, then I'll go to basically the front of the tooth. Now, you want to make sure that you're on a 45 degree angle or a bit more than that if possible, just so when you are levering it, you are making sure that you're doing it against the bone and the tooth rather than the next door tooth to the tooth because you don't want to cause any, any damage to that tooth. Uh, I then decided that I would need to go to this with a larger luxator just because the other one wasn't doing too much. So I get between the teeth, uh, trying to make sure that I'm against bone and the tooth, and then I am basically twisting that luxator in a way that, that forces the tooth upwards. So you're using it as a basically like a, a lever. Uh, what I'm looking for is any movement in that tooth. And if I see movement in the tooth, here I'm just checking on the patient, if I see movement in that tooth, that means that that movement that I'm doing and the levering that I'm doing there is doing what I want it to. So I'll, I'll kind of refocus on doing more of that. Um, here I've kind of skipped this and made it a little bit faster just because you can't really see an awful lot of the tooth. The, I think our camera person might have had a few too many beers before this one. So as we go here, I've gone back in with a smaller luxator and I'm focusing on whatever's making this tooth move. And when I find that, then I'll keep doing that pressure. So the pressure actually stretches the fibers that are holding the tooth with the bone. And if you stretch them, you loosen them, uh, and then eventually the, the tooth will start to pop up. So I'd basically got as much kind of vertical movement as I thought I could uh, and it just it, there was something that was holding it back so I then took my luxator and moved it to the buckle of the tooth and it was this tiny little movement in the end that um, basically got it up and you'll see here uh, when I take this tooth out and in the photo that I'll show you is that this root actually had a really really nice curve to it that I, I wasn't really expecting the curve that actually this tooth had made it a little bit more difficult and, and that was why when I tried that buckle movement it's just putting a different direction force on it sometimes that's all it, all it took so I was putting a lot of force in the mesial got it basically up to where I thought I could a little bit on the buckle and then the tooth popped up so now here we are doing the sutures so I will use some tweezers uh, normally I use some uh, some finer tweezers than this to basically hold the tissue in place first just so I've got something uh, to make sure that the tissue isn't moving around when I put the stitch through. I'm not using my favorite forceps here either, so I would normally would kind of pass this through in the one go, but these ones, they're not as user-friendly as what my other ones are, so I did it in two stages, which is fine. It did mean that I could use the, uh, these are the other tweezers that I was talking about. It meant that I could make sure that, that I'm in, actually positioning this one in the, right, in the right place. So this one is a really important one to do because it'll kind of set the standard for how easily you can do your other ones. And if you can get the tissue to approximate really well from this one, I've sped this video up here, if you can get the tissue to approximate really well on this first one, it makes the others a whole lot easier because you're basically then just joining the dots. Uh, how I do this is I make sure I get any excess in my left hand over my three fingers on the left, uh, and then I'll use the the tweezers or the forceps on the right hand side and then my uh, my index finger far down inside the mouth so I can actually tighten that knot as tightly as possible. I do two throws in the forward direction, on the next one I do one throw backwards and then one throw in the forward direction. Again tighten that and then get the assistant to cut that. Now we're going in again, I've sped this up a little bit. Um, so pass that through and then make the second pass through the tissue on the other side. Uh, this is often the, the more difficult part of the extraction just because it is a fiddly area to be involved in. Uh, somehow I've got a knot on that right hand side as well, so I've got my system to cut that there. So two throws there in the forward direction, and again using um, my index finger nice and close to the suture there. Uh, one throw in the backwards direction, and one throw again in the forward direction and then I had my assistant cut that for me. I then switched to a, a new suture which had a, a longer tail because we had to cut the other one. Pass that through. Again, I did this one in two stages as well. Uh, like I said, most of the time I try and do it in the one go, just saves a bit of time, but when I'm not using the, the forceps that I normally like, which are, are much longer than what these ones are, it does make it a bit more difficult. Um, so you can kind of see there, I'm twirling it around my left hand on those three end fingers. So that just grabs the excess. Uh, and then when I go in, it's a lot easier for me to get a lot closer to where I'm actually making that, that stitch. 
Uh, so one throw in the backwards direction, and then one throw forwards. And then the assistant will cut that. And then by this stage, I made the decision that I wanted to also uh, do one more stitch up the back of the tooth, or up the back of that incision line. And um, here, it went in a slightly different direction when I first put it in, so I had to readjust that a little bit. Uh, but I was actually able there that I could get enough of it through, that I could grab it with the forceps and also do it in the one pass, which you can see is a whole lot faster. Uh, and then we're approximating that stitch there. The left index finger again. So one throw backwards. And then we've got one throw forwards. And then to finish with, I get the assistant to cut that. Yeah, we've got four stitches in there, which gives us primary closure. So there's no actual hole there, uh, which means that it's great because food can't get stuck in there. But then also we get primary healing rather than secondary healing, which is always a little bit faster and it's always a bit cleaner as well. So we called the patient today. So we called the patient the next day. So we called the patient the next day and she was in really, really minimal pain, which she was really happy about because she wanted to try and stay off medications because of the pregnancy, if possible and she also reported no loss of any feeling to her tongue or the front of her face which is a, a nice thing. As always thanks so much for watching if you liked the video or you got something out of it please like and subscribe it really helps me out a lot if there's anyone that you know that might benefit from it please share it with them if you have any questions or comments put it in the comment section below I do read and reply to all of them as always thanks so much for watching